are live and doing a new episode of BDA Baby, Before, During, After Baby. Um, and I'm really excited to be talking today about a really big topic um, with the Egg Whisperer, which I don't know if you guys follow her, but she is amazing to follow and so informative about everything when it comes to conceiving, ovulation, fertility. Um, it's a really big topic. Thank you. Hi, mom. <laughs> I love when my mom tunes in. Um, so mom, we're also going to be talking about sex and sex positions again today. So just cover your ears if you don't want to hear it. Um, but uh, one of the big topics that a lot of you guys had asked to um, hear more about is fertility, ovulation, the confusion around that, um, how to know when you're ovulating, what best sex positions to do in order to conceive, uh, when you should start paying attention to your fertility, at what age. Um, <laughs> Mom, oh no, I'll leave. So I'm gonna bring on the Egg Whisperer. She was actually um, uh, referred to me by so many different people who knew I was doing this series because she talks so much about um, all of these different topics in a really informative way, in a relatable way, non-intimidating way. So I'm excited to talk to her. Uh, I will, Dr. Amy, live with her, hopefully right now. And I'm wearing a color today. It's a bold color choice. I know. Hi. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> Thanks for having me on today. Thank you so much for taking time to do this. I'm really excited to be talking to you. I've loved all of your videos because they're so, um, they're so informative and relatable in uh, such a crazy complex topic for so many of us and a really intimidating and daunting topic for um, so many of us. So I'm so excited to have you on and talk to us in a really non-intimidating way to be as informed as possible about fertility and ovulation sex positions, all things under this umbrella. So thank you. You're welcome. I look forward to it. Um, so I think um, there were so many different topics that you and I talked about uh, talking about today. I think we can maybe start with just fertility and the topic of um, fertility. There are obviously so many things that go into that. But one of the biggest questions that we got from a lot of uh, women was when it is well, actually, before we get to that, why don't you just tell a little bit about what you do so people understand that? Absolutely. I basically went to school for a really long time <laughs> to figure out that an egg and sperm make a baby. My sister is a cardiac anesthesiologist, and she went to school for way fewer years than me. And so I went to school basically for 17 years to figure out egg sperm make, an, make a baby. And so yeah. basically, fertility doctors are just OBGYNs who then did extra training in baby making. And so we solve problems that are related to, for example, people who are having miscarriages, people who are fertility curious and just wanna figure out what's going on with their fertility, people who are already trying to conceive and are having a hard time, people who, let's say, are LGBTQI, who need, let's say, an egg donor, a sperm donor, and a surrogate. So we basically are baby makers and we have access to so much science out there but I think what's really important for people to realize and understand is that we can't solve every problem. And that's why learning about your fertility when you still have fertility, when you still have eggs, is the most important message that I try to bring awareness to by, you know, being on Instagram and doing my YouTube shows in a way that's not intimidating. Yeah. Well, I think it's such a complicated topic and one that uh, as a woman, you don't really necessarily focus on at all until as you said in your video, one day you say, oh, I want to have a baby. And then, right. you know, you have to dive into, for a lot of people, you dive into this whole experience and exploration of what for your fertility is, what your cycle is, is your cycle mm -hmm. normal? Is it abnormal? How to know when you're ovulating? And it can be a really daunting and intimidating topic because most of the time when you are at that point in your life, when you want to dive into that, it's, you want to get pregnant and you want to get pregnant fast. Right. So, um, so I think that it's, it's so great that you're, you know, getting that information out there for women and for anybody who wants to know about it, but doing it in a way that isn't so scary because it can be a really scary topic to dive into. Right. Um, I think first I let, let's just focus on what I was just saying, which is, you know, when you choose to focus on fertility, when 
would you as a professional in your field advise women to take a look at their fertility or even focus on fertility? So my hope is one day that is that fertility screening is just automatically part of our, um, you know, medical checkups as women. So we do cervical cancer screening with pap smears. We do breast cancer screening with mammograms. We should be doing fertility screening from the very beginning. I feel like by the age of 21, for example, if your mom had fertility issues, you should get your fertility levels checked. I call these my egg whisper golden rules. Mm -hmm. If let's say your mom had problems and went through early menopause, you don't want to find that out when you're 35, right? Yeah. You want to be asking these questions, but how do you know what questions to ask unless you sat with a fertility doctor or an OBGYN and went through your family history and what your goals are and the timing and what's going on with your cycles. And then at 25, for example, I feel like everyone should get their levels checked and then really look at when they want to have babies, how many babies they want. Do they have any sign symptoms of, let's say, endometriosis or fibroids? Because you've probably had friends, I imagine, that it takes them years to get to that diagnosis. And the last thing people should be doing is doing these fertility checks, let's say, at 39 for the first time. That's so unfair. Right. And then they start learning that, oh, my goodness, I should have been doing this when I was 29 because now I have endometriosis that I didn't even know about. So I just... I just want to stop that frustration that people can get when they find out way too late. And fertility medicine is just like any other sub any other medical specialty. There are diagnostic tools that we can use, just like, you know, if you have a high blood sugar, there's there's things that you can do, but you can't just like snap a selfie and then send it in. You know what I mean? We we actually have to do tests because there's no such thing as like, oh, I feel fertile, or you know, just because I look amazing. I mean, I I wish that for women, you know, Tom Brady you know, he's like, he makes 40 look 20, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but our ovaries aren't like that. You know, we right. can't stick Botox in them or anything like that. So yeah. I hope that people will just ask their fertility doctors and, or their OBGYNs when they go in for their pap smears and say things like, can I get my AMH level check? Pelvic ultrasound, please. You know, that bimanual exam isn't enough for a lot of people to detect polyps, fibroids, or endometriosis. So I feel like those kinds of things are, are hopefully tools that people can ask their doctors to use for them if let's say you're fertility curious or you want to know, you want to learn more about your body. And when you talk about getting a fertility screening, when you go yeah. into your doctor, yeah. I know you just mentioned getting your AMH levels checked, which if you haven't um, really taken a deep dive into fertility journey, you might not know what AMH is, but can you explain a little bit more about what a fertility exam or testing your fertility might look like? Absolutely. And I've come up, you've probably heard of it. It's called the tushy check or the tushy method. Mm -hmm. And these are literally the five tests that fertility doctors do. We look at your fallopian tubes. That's what the T stands for. And that's through a procedure called the HSG. And that's really for someone, mm -hmm. I think, who, let's say, has been trying for a year and hasn't gotten pregnant yet. Anyone who has a history of an STD, like gonorrhea or chlamydia, anyone even who has high-risk HPV, because we know that that's an STD as well, and that might increase risk of having a tubal blockage. Then there's the U, which is a pelvic ultrasound, which is basically a visit with Wanda. That's what mm -hmm. fertility patients call the probe. Right. I call it my, micro my microphone on my karaoke machine. Mm -hmm. um, S is for the sperm, right? So checking the swimmers and seeing how fast they're swimming. H is for all the hormones like the FSH, estradiol, and AMH. And then we also do preconception labs, for example, looking at thyroid, vitamin D, your blood count. And then the Y is for your genetics. So looking at whether the egg source and the sperm source are genetically compatible with very simple recessive gene testing that we do looking at, you know, right now we're at a panel of about 300 genes. And then sometimes some people would benefit from doing a chromosome analysis as well. So I know I just rattled off a whole bunch of stuff and some people might be like, oh, that's too much for me. Mm -hmm. But honestly, you can get that all done in one menstrual cycle and within one month, know what's going on with your body and you can create a fertility roadmap for yourself and, um, you know, not leave the guesswork out of it. Is that something that you're advising women to do as early as 21? Or is that something to do when you, you know, have a partner and you really want to get pregnant and you want to just kind of dabble in that area a little bit? When is that something that you should be looking at doing? You know, I, everyone's, you know, when is the right time to have a baby? Everyone's journey is different. Everyone's situation is different. Like I see egg freezers that come in at 25. And let's say they share with me that they actually had chlamydia when they were 21, but they're not ready to have a baby for 10 years. That's kind of what they predict for themselves. So I will actually want to do a tube test for them because they might actually need IVF 
to have the family size that they want because we know that chlamydia or gonorrhea can block fallopian tubes. I'd want them to freeze more eggs now rather than find out later after they've been trying for a year that they actually needed IVF from the very beginning. Or if their mom, for example, had a blood clot in her leg. Well, I actually would want to know if she carries a gene for let's say factor five Leiden, for example, or her sister had several miscarriages. Well, I might want to know if she has a chromosomal um, imbalance. So mm -hmm. it's not like you have to do all of these things, but I feel like if you talk to a doctor and, and really, you know, think, or, you know, they, they gather your history, they'll have a pretty good idea as to what the most efficient testing would be for you. But you could also do all the tests, let's say by the time you're 32. So, so I dragged my sister literally kicking and screaming and I froze her eggs when she was 32 years old. So I feel like that can be a magic number too. Let's say if you don't have kids yet for you to really seriously you know, do these kinds of tests if you haven't already. So that was another big question that came up was yeah. if you haven't had kids yet, at what age would you advise people to consider freezing their eggs, freeze their eggs? Um, I remember being at a dinner table conversation with one of my girlfriends who's a little bit older than me and um, someone telling her that by 34, 35, that your eggs are pretty much cooked and it would be really challenging to have your first child. So that's a, a question that I think a lot of women want to know about women are having babies later than they once were. So at what age would you recommend women to consider freezing their eggs? By the time of 32. So if, you, if you're thinking that at some point you want kids and maybe two, I would say freezing your eggs by 32. And I didn't mean to make that rhyme at all either, but it just kind of <laughs> does. I just realized that. But I feel like that's a really good year. Um, however, if let's say you're 25 and you've had your levels checked, um, and you see that your levels might be in the lower range of normal, then it might be a good idea to do it ahead of time. And so that's why I kind of want people to do one check in at 25. And then depending on the level, then maybe, you know, see what's going on with your life and then maybe check every three years and then maybe by 32 freeze eggs. Okay. And obviously when women go to the doctor once a year to go do their physical or their OBGYN appointment, um, people's insurance covers that when you're saying for women to go to an additional doctor, fertility doctor like yourself to get, you know, their levels checked, a pelvic exam, et cetera, would insurance cover that for women? It depends on your employer. A lot of employers now are actually covering infertility diagnostic testing. Okay. And then a lot of clinics, you know, they offer these types of fertility checks at a really low rate. So it is something that people can have access to without feeling like they're gonna spend thousands of dollars. So I think the information is accessible and it is affordable so that you're not surprised, you know, later on in life and, you know, wish you had gotten your levels checked um, at an earlier age. Okay. Um, and when it comes to cycles, I think a lot of women are, um, myself included, you don't really necessarily pay attention to what a normal cycle is necessarily. I mean, you hear when you get your period for the first time, you either have a 28 day cycle, a 32 day cycle, something like that. Um, but when it comes to when you ovulate during your cycle, how to know when you're ovulating, that seems to be much more complicated. And then there are ovulation tests, which work mm -hmm. for some people and not for others. So that whole topic for majority of people, including myself, is very complicated and seems yeah. to be really intimidating to wrap your head around. Right. I think that a lot of people don't understand that. And the first time they start learning about that is when they're trying to conceive. But I feel like right. there's so much power in knowing about your menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can really use that energy that, you know, you probably see that you feel more energy, for example, in the beginning of your cycle. And maybe in the second half, you don't have much energy, you know, as much. And you can change your eating habits and slow down or increase your exercise habits. But for women, we actually have something called discharge, right? So mm -hmm. before ovulation, you actually don't, you might see like a thick white discharge. And then a few days before you actually see an egg white cervical, we call it egg white cervical mucus. I mean, just literally it looks like egg white. So it's really clear um, discharge that you see it usually starts about three days before ovulation. And you probably have heard the term baby dancing or do the baby dance. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's really hard to have my patients, the idea of having a sexathon when you're a fertility <laughs> patient is like, you know, not some, it's hard, you know, I mean, you know, you're right. so stressed out, but yeah. And then generally the, the discharge changes after ovulation. So just knowing that, you know, 
a lot of people don't palpate their cervix, so you can actually take a finger and stick it in the vagina and then palpate the, the, the os, which would be like the circle part of the donut, for example, right. and you can actually feel it and see it open. Most people don't do that. But then there's yeah. also the OPKs, you know, the, I wish I, I wish people could just pee and flush, right? Rather than just constantly check these things. But, you know, urine is actually a pretty good way of detecting something called the LH surge. Mm -hmm. So that happens approximately 36 hours before that egg is released. So that's another good way of figuring out when you're ovulating. And that would be when you pee on those sticks that you get at the pharmacy. Exactly. And there's another newer test that just came out. It's called PROVE, P-R-O-O-V, and it measures a metabolite of progesterone that can also confirm ovulation, and that metabolite is called PDG. So that's another cool test for people, for example, who have PCOS or they just aren't sure if their LH sticks are actually accurate for them or not. So that's another cool test that you can do. And there's also temperature tracking, but I, I tell people you might stab your eye with it. Just throw away the thermometer. <laughs> Forget. The thermometer. That was another question actually that came up was yeah. um, birth control. That's a really big topic, of course. Also birth control being not great for you to be on for a long period of time. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of women go on birth control when they are in high school, if they mm -hmm are sexually active and you get your period, you're kind of just automatically sent on birth control, not really knowing or understanding how every single person's body and hormones react differently to a variety of different forms of birth control. Mm -hmm. um, but also understanding, you know, do you stay on birth control until you're ready to get pregnant? Do you do a natural way, which is, you know, a temperature check or tracking your ovulation, what is your advice on the natural way versus being on a birth control? Yeah, I mean, birth control pills can trick people. They make us feel like we're fertile because you're seeing that regular period. And mm -hmm. we say that they can mask infertility. And I've seen so many heartbreaking stories of women who started when they were 16, they stopped when they're 32, and then no periods again. And they're made to feel like the reason was because they were on birth control pills the whole time. But the reality is if they hadn't been, they probably would have noticed those cycle changes. So I petitioned birth control pill companies. No one has listened to me quite yet. They should include like a coupon or some sort of lab slip every year when you refill your birth control pills. If you've been on them that long, you just go get your levels checked to see what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are so many non-contraceptive benefits for birth control pills, reducing ovarian cancer risk, for example. Um, preventing the progression of endometriosis, decreasing anemia, right? So there are great benefits and obviously preventing pregnancy. So no woman should feel like birth control pill caused her infertility. But the problem is it tricks us into thinking that we don't have a problem when we might. So that's why getting your levels checked, doing an ultrasound at some point would make sense for people who are on birth control pills for a really long period of time. And when you get your levels checked, if you're on birth control, are those levels accurate, even though you have hormones in your body? Yes. Yeah. So that's a good question. And so that's a question I get a lot too. So the AMH level, for example, can be suppressed just maybe around 20% if you're on birth control pills. So fertility doctors know that. So when you get your level checked of AMH, and if it's a little bit, you know, slightly lower than what we would expect at your age, we don't freak out. We just say, well, yeah, it's, you're on birth control pills. We're good. Mm -hmm. And let's just maybe repeat it in six months to a year and see where we're at. Okay. Um, PCOS, you just mentioned, that yeah. was also a big topic. Uh, I know a lot of people who struggle with PCOS. It seems like it's been a big topic in the media that people have been openly talking about, which I think is great, um, mm -hmm. as well as endometriosis. For women who are being faced with that at a young age, or as you just mentioned, coming mm -hmm. off birth control and realizing, okay, I'm not getting pregnant. Maybe I have PCOS. Maybe I have endometriosis. And realizing that at a later point in their life, what would your advice be for women who are being faced with that diagnosis, but do want to have kids? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a lot of um, well-intentioned doctors that sometimes tell patients things like, oh, you don't have to fix your PCOS until you're ready to have babies. Or if you have endometriosis, oh, getting pregnant will fix that endometriosis, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's really unfair. So Is I that think- not true? It's, no, it's not. No, it's not okay. true. So I think of PCOS as number one, please confirm this ovary syndrome, meaning if someone tells you you have it, you have to say, I'd like to have you prove it to me. Like, why do you think I have it? Some women can be curvy and their doctor just says you have PCOS and their periods are irregular without ever checking a single hormone level. 
and then they find out later that they were actually in premature menopause. I've seen that before, and it's wow. it's it's not something that I want to happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And then for endometriosis, endometriosis is a fertility threatening condition, and there are treatments that you can do, there are surgeries that you can have done. I think anyone who has endometriosis should seriously consider egg freezing, no matter what your age. And so just knowing that will get you to the right doctor so that you can get the help that you need and you can get pain management as well. So for PCOS, just to, I've also called it, you can see I, I have lots of uh, things that I <laughs> use to tell people that this yeah. stuff isn't as bad as, as it you know, might seem online and that's HOPE syndrome. So I call it HOPE because just because you have PCOS doesn't mean you have bad eggs. It doesn't mean you will have fertility issues, but it's a condition that we think is most likely genetic and it requires lifelong management and maintenance and we need to heal PCOS H-E-A-L and and focus on that so that when you're ready to get pregnant it's not as hard for you mm -hmm. I mean imagine being diagnosed with PCOS at 38 years old your testosterone's high your insulin is high your BMI your BMI is high you're in a highly inflammatory state and it's just going to take that much longer to fix it whereas if you had treated it you know much earlier in life by the time you're ready to get pregnant, it won't be as much of a challenge. And what is the treatment that goes into PCOS? Because I know so many, I mean, I, I've also heard of a lot of doctors throwing out a PCOS diagnosis and then, you know, you go to another doctor for a second opinion. If you're told by a girlfriend, maybe like, just go ahead and get that checked again. And you find out that you actually don't have PCOS and that that was just a quick diagnosis, um, mm -hmm. which is so scary for so many women to just be diagnosed with this PCOS and then to find out that you don't have it is uh, really scary, of course, but what would the treatment or healing look like for someone who has PCOS? Absolutely, so just like the elements of HOPE, H-O-P-E, so the H is high androgen levels. So we wanna check those, see where we're at. And depending on where we're at, there are a lot of different treatments. It's metformin, there's spironolactone, there's birth control pills, there's nutraceuticals like ovacetol, lipoic acid, and acetylcysteine. Then we have the, the follicles on the ovaries. And I think the reason why it's so scary to be given the diagnosis of polycystic is because we think we have these big cysts on right. our ovaries, but the reality is we don't. We have teeny, teeny, tiny little cysts that are called follicles. So there's not really a treatment for, for the follicles on your ovaries. It's just a, an important diagnostic test to have done to have someone do an ultrasound and look. Mm -hmm. And then the P part is irregular period. So it's really important if you have PCOS to to induce a period. I like to induce pa uh, periods for my patients every three months who have PCOS who are not trying to conceive just to prevent a condition called endometrial hyperplasia. Okay, okay. so that's where your lining gets really thick and that can be a risk factor for uterine cancer later in life. So inducing periods with progesterone will be really important. And then the E part is eating and exercise. So being your healthiest healthy is really important and that's different for everybody. And it's not about a BMI, it's about what feels good for you and looking at your lifestyle and getting to your healthiest version of health, you know, as far as, and, and I think it's really important for people to have a, a good team around them. So mm -hmm. a therapist, a nutritionist, a, a, a trainer, um, you know, someone that's going to help you with uh, meditating and mindfulness. I think that's all really important if you have the diagnosis of PCOS. Yeah. I think speaking of the exercise and um, healthy eating, I think cortisol is such a big part of uh, people getting pregnant and challenges with getting pregnant and acupuncture was another big topic that people had asked about as far as, you know, taking herbs, making acupuncture appointments, helping them yeah. uh, get a regular cycle, reduce their cortisol levels, because when you want to get pregnant and you're not getting pregnant, mm -hmm. of course, you get really stressed out and want to figure out exactly what's wrong with you, how to make that, uh, how to find a quick fix for that. So cortisol is also a big factor when it comes to pregnancy, right? Yeah, I mean, stress is never good in pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, especially right now with COVID. I feel like we're seeing more pregnancy complications because of the amount of stress that women are having. So I joke with my, I mean, I, I tell lots of jokes, but I consider every patient of mine VIP, a very important pregnancy. And now more than ever, I want people to just surround themselves with love as much as they possibly can to, to reduce their stress. That might reduce the risk of other complications like, high blood pressure in pregnancy. And so, yeah, I do, I do totally agree with you. And is that those complications that you're seeing right now, especially, is that just due to anxiety around being pregnant in a pandemic? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that not, being, not sleeping well, not eating well, 
um, just being on a, just constantly stressed out, I don't think that it, it helps at all. So, yeah. But yeah. those constant stress levels are, you're saying are unique to this world that we're living in right oh, now. Oh, absolutely. The, the My patient stress levels are, um, you know, if like normally we're like here, we're, we're all right about here right now wow. on a, on a, on a scale. Right. Yeah. And during pregnancy, obviously that's not an ideal situation mm -hmm. to, to be. No, in. I mean, my patients are already pregnant and worried, you know, they're always yeah. having that, those catastrophic thoughts because they've never had good news up until the time I've given it to them. So they're always thinking that something's going to go wrong. And then now with COVID they're, they're having nightmares of like being in a grocery store without a mask on, you know, and that's what's right. keeping them up at night. Yeah, I know it's such a, it's being pregnant in a pandemic because I was, it's such a crazy other factor to be thinking oh, yeah. about, you know, are you going to get COVID if you go here? Is that, is that going to um, increase your chances of getting COVID? And I think so many women, especially if you're pregnant, I mean, I have uh, several friends who are currently pregnant or who have been pregnant during this pandemic. And it's a very interesting experience, I think, not only for them as just first time moms, most of them, but also just the whole experience of pregnancy, stress levels, that already being stressful and then having, you know, not being able to be around your family. Like there are so many factors that I think normally would calm a pregnant person, but you know, in the world that we live in, add stress to that. Um, another big topic I think, and this is I think helpful for everybody to know is at what point do you see a doctor like yourself? I mean, of course, if you want to be doing checks to just casually check your fertility health and your fertility levels when you're younger and pregnancy isn't necessarily on your mind, how long before somebody who's trying to conceive should they go and see a doctor like yourself? I mean, I think from the very beginning, honestly. Okay. I think from the, if you're ready to have a baby, do that preconception check, get an ultrasound, take a look at your uterus. I mean, I, I'm just, it, it's just heartbreaking when you come in, you have a miscarriage and there's a fibroid inside your uterus and they say the fibroid did it and you'd already been trying, trying for over six months. Like imagine the heartache you could have saved yourself if you had just seen the fibroid, had it removed even before you started to conceive. And so I, I use the analogy of like, you know, um, when you're planning a safari, don't you like read the books, go to the travel clinic, get all the vaccinations first, you know, getting pregnant shouldn't just be going to a bar and having a shot of tequila, although that sounds way funner than coming and seeing me and having a probe and an all, you know, a blood draw yes. and all that kind of stuff. Right. But I feel like, you know, pregnancy is, um, a, 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 a it's a medical thing and there can be lots of complications with it. And we have to take it very, very seriously. I think, mm -hmm. especially, especially now as people are waiting longer to get pregnant, people are heavier than they have been in the past. Like all of those things add more complications. So I feel like it's really good to see an OBGYN or fertility doctor even before you even start trying. So not necessarily just seeing an OBGYN if you want to get pregnant, going ahead and seeing a fertility doctor in addition to that. Absolutely. Because OB joins, like I said, they're very well-intentioned. They're really, they're, it's, and depending on the community that, 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 that you're in, they might not be as comfortable reviewing your AMH with you, reviewing your family size goals with you and getting to know you like someone like me, you know, right. like fertility doctors will really just, you know, ask you how many kids you want. This is your age. These are your levels. This is what it means. This is what I think you need. An OB join might say, oh, well, this is your AMH. I think go ask the fertility doctor, you know? Yeah. Um, I just saw somebody's comment saying that they're 32 years old and this conversation is freaking them out, which I think that this is, you know, my mom, um, my mom had me at 34 mm -hmm. and she um, then had, you know, my three siblings after me. And I think there is a lot, I was talking last week in the Instagram live that we did, there is such a big blessing in the amount of information that we get and that we're talking about this topic right now and we're you know uh, spreading information about people being aware of their fertility aware of their cycle ovulation when to get pregnant and there's also part of that that i feel like a lot of women look at and think oh my god this is so intimidating and this is so scary whatever happened to just as you said going out having sex and getting pregnant and not really thinking so much about the complexities behind that. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because I think there are so many women who are, you know, so stressed out about conceiving, will they be able to, fertility, you know, that whole, all those topics. Right. And that's because it's so important, 
so important to them. And the thing is that the information that I'm sharing should, it's not fear-based. It's just, it's, it's based out of love for people mm -hmm. and my desire to stop the tears, like to never hear another person say, I wish I had known this first. And, um, you know, anytime a woman says, I want to get pregnant, she's also saying, but might not realize that I'm also accepting the risk that there could be a miscarriage. It might take me longer. I might have a stillbirth. And so I feel like it's really important for people to hear those things up front and say that there are actually things that you can do that are in your control that could potentially give you a higher chance of having a healthier pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people say things like, well, if God meant for me to have, you know, it's like, why don't I just try and see? Then, then what I would say is, look, like with every other medical thing, if you had a, not that trying to get pregnant should ever be a problem, but like if you had something like a heart palpitation, wouldn't you just go and get it checked out and, and make sure everything's fine first rather than just guessing and, and thinking that it could be fine when it might not be. So yeah. I know those analogies may not really help people that much, but I just feel like getting to know your fertility should be a, just all about that saying, you know, test, don't guess, and knowledge is power and more information is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so if you're, if you're working with someone that you know isn't going to give you the information in a fear-based way, then hopefully that will be a good, um, a good experience for you. Do you think that there is something to, you hear all these stories all the time, of women trying for so long and not getting pregnant and then all of a sudden saying, I'm going to take the summer off and boom, you get pregnant. Yeah, I mean, what I tell people about that is when two people love each other, miracles can happen. And you never know when you're going to ovulate the good egg. So I right. never, I, you know, whenever I talk to anybody, I say, I see you and I look at you and you're a fertile person to me and you have healthy eggs and I'm going to do whatever I can to find that healthy egg for you. Because I think if, you know, that saying, if you believe it, you will achieve it. I yeah. know that it doesn't always work for everybody, but I feel like if you have that feeling about yourself, then you'll still have sex, right? Yeah. If you're in a heterosexual relationship and this applies to you, obviously. And um, you just never know when you're gonna ovulate the golden egg. And so I do think there is something to be said about just finding joy in every single day and every moment and still being sexually active and you just never know when things will happen. Someone just asked, what does a good egg mean? I think that's a great question because you, um, I was thinking about it because I was talking to my sister and I just had, um, my daughter six months ago, but you, when you're born, you're born with all your eggs, which is such a crazy thing to think about. <laughs> and, right. and you don't really, as, as we were talking about necessarily go and test your eggs or your fertility until you're, you know, maybe 20 or however, whatever age you might be, um, wanting to do that. But what does it mean to have a good egg? Because that wasn't, something that I don't think women necessarily know about until you dive into this subject. Yeah, totally. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is this. 100% of us will run out of all of our eggs at some point, and most of us run out of our healthy eggs by the time we're 40. So in order to have a healthy embryo, you have to have an egg so that that's good enough that once it's fertilized by sperm, the embryo divides normally. If the egg, let's say, isn't able to be fertilized, that could be because the egg is, um, you know, has lower quality than the, em or if it is fertilized, if it's lower quality, then the embryo can have chromosomal abnormalities. So if I were to give you another example, if you have a 25 year old egg versus a 40 year old egg, that 25 year old egg will have a 95% chance of being genetically normal. That 40 year old egg will have a 10% chance of being genetically normal. So that's the difference. Wow. It's, it's nuts. And it's just so unfair that we haven't just poured in so much research into this so that we can help women basically, you know, cure this issue of age-related infertility so that mm -hmm. I don't have to work as hard. That'd be pretty awesome. Like there could be some like vaccine, like wouldn't that be cool? I mean, like Dolly Parton, she should throw in millions of dollars for us so that we can reverse ovarian aging. I mean, I know she had something to do with the vaccine, so maybe she's watching and she can help maybe. us out here. But yeah, at I mean, what at what age do you tell women that maybe it's not a good idea to get pregnant as far as getting older? I mean, I'm a I'm a pretty uh, stubborn person. If you have an egg, I'm going to try for you. My oldest patient that I've tried for is 51 years old, wow. literally with her own eggs. And um, that's the oldest embryo I've ever created. The oldest patient I've ever helped have a pregnancy with her own eggs is 45 years old. 
And I'm just waiting for the 46, 47 and up patient that I can finally say I've helped her achieve a, a healthy pregnancy. But there have been, I think, less than 20 IVF pregnancies in women over the age of 45 since 1980. So that just shows you that it's really hard to find a good egg if you're over 40. But the thing is, I have to be careful because I just feel like it's so unfair for men to like, you know, when George Clooney had his twins, everyone thought that's really cute, right? But if a woman comes in in her 50s ready to have twins or ready to have kids, we all look at her like she has a horn coming out of her head. And I just right. find that extremely unfair. Right. So, you know, I want to give everyone a chance because I feel like you can't have closure to move on to other options unless you actually see what it would be like with your own egg. So I just feel like everyone should at least have a chance. But I, I do tell women, you know, it's hard to find a good egg if you're over 40 and you're going to be a mother one way or another. It might not be with your own DNA and that's going to be okay. And the last thing is that your heart won't know the difference between your genes or someone else's genes once you have that baby in your arms. Mm -hmm. So, and I really want patients, especially over the age of 40, to do whatever they can to minimize their time as a patient and maximize their time as a parent just because of their age. Right. So when if someone comes into you at the age of 40, do you just kind of get right to it? And Oh, yeah. I'm like, what are you doing tomorrow? Yeah, come on in. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, let's just be as aggressive as you feel comfortable being. And right. for a lot of people that see me over 40, that means doing IVF. Right. And when it comes, since you just talked about George Clooney and you yeah. know, men having babies later, sperm is also such a big part of people's fertility journeys that they don't necessarily focus on until, you know, you've been trying for eight months or something and you don't get pregnant. But uh, sperm testing is also something that's really important to be doing in a fertility journey as well. Absolutely. An embryo is half egg, half sperm. It isn't mm -hmm. like it's 10% sperm and 90% egg. You need to have a sparkling sperm to have a sparkling embryo, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. so you're, wait for it, Catherine. I got another method for you. Are you ready Love for it? it? <laughs> it's called balls method, literally. Balls, you got the tushy and you got the balls. Great. To remind people the things that you need to look at for sperm. So that's background genetics, anatomy, mm -hmm. lifestyle, labs, supplements, and sex. So just really simple stuff and they're do-it-yourself sperm kits that guys can do at home in the privacy of their home to get their sperm checked. You know, there's, there's probably like five or six out there right now that people can order wow. online to find out how fast their swimmers are. And then I also tell people it's always nice to have sperm on ice because literally women are waiting longer to have babies, men are waiting longer to have babies, and we know with advanced paternal age, there's an increased risk of having babies with abnormalities like chromosomal issues, as well as other problems like schizophrenia, autism, ADD, ADHD, and bipolar disorder. So if I had a choice, if I had a guy who came in at 45 and he's like, you know what, I froze my sperm when I was 35, I'd be like, that is awesome. I'm going to mm -hmm. use that stuff for my IVF cycle. Right. So I feel like, you know, with younger people watching this, this might motivate them to take that step as well for themselves. Okay, got it. Um, and then to wrap up, let's talk about sex, because Ooh. that was such a big <laughs> topic that um, is really popular for you to be talking about is really a big topic that a lot of people asked about sex, obviously, great way to get pregnant for a lot of people. Um, but knowing the right timing to do that uh, in, in your cycle every okay. month, and for some people, not every month, every other month. Um, and what would you uh, tell people about when to have sex to conceive and also the different positions that you find to be the most helpful in order to maximize conception. Totally. So what I like to express to people is that the journey to have a baby should be joyful mm -hmm. and not, not something that you fight with your partner about, ideally. Right. And we don't want there ever to be a sex emergency. So ovulation shouldn't feel like a time that there should be, that that should happen. Right. And so when it comes to sex and frequency, more is always better. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, there's no such thing that less is more. I mean, I literally have patients that are like, but I read online that every three days was the way to do it. I'm like, but I just told you it's like at least every other day. And then if I tell someone you can have sex, I don't like to tell people every day. Right. Because then they get stressed out because that might not be something that they can do. But when the answer is, well, how about three times a day? I'm like, okay, you clearly don't have a problem in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So basically what I tell people is track your ovulation, start having sex every other day, about three days before ovulation, before you usually see that peak, and then at least two to three days after that peak, because those LH sticks are inaccurate. 
They're not the best tools that tell you exactly when you're ovulating. If you have an LH positive, you could still have ovulated the day before. If you have that positive, it actually might not be two days until you actually ovulate. So that's why coating the field with sperm, knowing that sperm can live even up to five to six days is really important. We want sperm waiting for egg. We don't want egg waiting for sperm. And that egg will sit in the fallopian tube for about 12 to 24 days. So that's what I tell people about sex. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. And what about sex positions that maximize fertility? Yeah, so you'll love this one. The position that you enjoy the most, right? Oh, good. The best sex will give the best sperm, will make the sperm sparkle, and hopefully they'll know where to go. So yeah, so I have, I have people that ask me that all the time. And then my favorite question is, well, does my, do I have to give my wife an orgasm? And I'm like, <laughs> well, she might kill you if you don't. But honestly, like, you know, what I said in the beginning, you want it to be something that is enjoyable and fun. Right. And, and, and so, yeah. Yeah. I do think that, you know, there are so many, I have a lot of girlfriends who, you know, make sex a scheduled oh, event yeah. in order to get yeah. pregnant. And of course that, um, you know, has an effect on your relationship and, you know, the romance goes a little bit sideways when you, right. you know, when you make it so strict or if you're, you know, on some sort of a schedule. So I, I think that that advice is so great to be able to just, you know, be sexually active in order to increase your chances, but not necessarily say, okay, we have to go right now. Right. Has to be happening right then and there. Cause that's obviously adds a ton of stress to the situation. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank mm -hmm. you so much. I mean, I think I could talk to you for so much longer because this is such a big and uh, crazy topic, but it's such a great one to be informed about and to be talked to in such a relatable way where people aren't necessarily intimidated. I'm sure we're going to get tons more questions. So hopefully we'll mm -hmm. do something like this again soon because the questions, I mean, I had tons of questions that people wrote in just wanting to know more about fertility and awareness around it. And, um, and I think the way that you talk about it, as I said, is such um, a relatable way in, in a topic that is really scary for a lot of uh, women. So thank you so much for taking time and hopefully thank we'll do it again soon. Friend. And congrats on baby Lila. I have to give Aww. a shout out to my niece, Lila. When I told her I was coming on, she was so excited. So her name, her, her name is L-Y-L-A also. So oh my I gosh, I love that. Her. I know. I hope she didn't hear the sex stuff, but I have a feeling she did. <laughs> she wants to be a fertility doctor. Over your ears. I know. Oh, that's Have so years. great. I yeah. love that. Another yeah. Lila. Yeah. Another so great. Lila. Awesome. Well, thank you so You're much. Welcome. Thanks, Catherine. Bye. Bye-bye. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. That was such an informative conversation. I loved it. I know you guys had so many questions, and I saw a couple of them as I was having the conversation um, about fertility and ovulation and a lot of you asking about uh, this being really stressful topic. So I think this is a great conversation and a great topic to have another Instagram live about and also just to be talking to more people about their journeys with fertility struggles and, um, uh, and success in that department as well, because um, I definitely don't want anybody leaving these conversations feeling extra stressed out about their uh, pregnancy age or just future with wanting to have kids in general. So um, thank you again so much for tuning in to another episode of BDA Baby. I will see you guys next Thursday for another conversation. And I'm really excited about the guests that we're going to be talking to next week because it's going to be a really great experience um, that's very open and honest about uh, a fertility journey. So I'll share that with you guys soon. And thank you for tuning in.